right. I know, I was feeling that way earlier too. We're just really glad to have Nelson with us today. This morning was a, an awesome morning and oh, God was glorified. It's just been a, a wonderful weekend getting to know him and he's he, we've been taking him around in the area and he is very well liked at the Hawksville Diner right now. <laughs> so we're just going to get started with some prayer. We're going to get we're just going to get this wonderful evening of deliverance going. Y'all ready for some freedom? Yes. Amen. 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 Yeah. Father, we just thank you for this time together. You're an awesome God. We love you so much. God, I thank you for what you've already done and what's going to happen this evening, Lord. We just thank you for Jesus. And we thank you for the truth being known tonight to everyone. I thank you, God, that we will not leave this place the same way we came. We will, we will leave changed and feeling so full of the Holy Spirit, and all the others will be gone. I just thank you for that, God, and we just give you all the glory. Everything that comes out of our mouths tonight, I pray that they will be from you only and not us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to do a couple songs to get you going. Because I think y'all need it, and so do I. Yeah. All right. Three, <laughs> three, four, one. I've been in the church since I was a little girl, 
And I never had quite understood why, even though we've been born again, even though we knew who we were, we didn't really know, you know? And there was always seemed to be a little bit of bondage hanging out and a little bit of that, you know, slavery thing going on. And a lot of it's religion, and he'll talk about that. But I just, I'm just so grateful that God never gives up on us. And he comes to set us free. And there's victory in Jesus. And we're going to do that song right now, Victory in Jesus. And those who come to my Sunday morning services, go ahead, y'all. Those who come to Sunday morning services know what this plunge means. So I want to see your plunge, okay? Okay, it makes it feel better. Because uh, I'd actually been just going through this thing with God myself of 
asking him to, you know, wondering why I react to things sometimes the way I react to them. You ever wonder about that? Like, why, why does that set me off? Yes. Or why does it make me feel this way? Or, you know, what's going on with me? So I asked him that, and, and as I watched this, I was like, oh my goodness, God, thank you. So, to make a long story short, I, I just was so grateful. <coughs> I can a little while. I was so grateful, and um, I called the ministry just to say thank you. And I said, I just want to say thank you so much. I don't remember what I said. I said, you know, if you've got somebody there that prays with you, I would love to do that. But I already did the prayer, so I was just going on and on like I do. And, um, and I get this call back on the next day, and we actually were here rehearsing for the Shenandoah Jamboree show that we do. And my phone rang, and it was from Kentucky. And I thought, I don't know who this is. Maybe I should take it. So I took it, and I heard this sweet girl say, Hi, this is Stephanie. I'm with Restored to Freedom. And I thought, okay, she's like Southern. I like her. And um, she, she was from Kentucky. So I ran in there because we were rehearsing, and I ran in there to talk to her. And, and she just, I just remember, she said, oh, girl, we, I just think we're going to be friends. And lo and behold, we are very good friends now. And um, she's went through, she has just helped me through so many things. And so to make a long story short, we were talking one day, and I, I had talked to Nelson back and forth a couple times on Facebook and stuff. And I said, I'd love for you to come. I did this little church service at Cooter's place in Lorraine. He goes, Cooter's? You mean the Dukes of Hazard? <laughs> <laughs> and so, so we got to talk, and I said, well, would you come do that? Because I know he travels all over the world, and he'll tell you all about that. Um, he, he left a quarter of a million dollar job. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And, and decided, ah, oh, this is so much better working for Jesus, right? So um, I just was so impressed with that. And so I say that to tell you that there is a basket in the back. And I would like for you to get to his ministry if you feel like you would like to do that. Because he doesn't charge anything. We're not paying anything. So, and also all his books are in the back. So, you know, you need to take a few books home to some other people. Because I was really hoping that all the people that were here this morning would bring some more people. But some did. Yeah. Some glad they're here. And, um. So anyway, I just wanted to share that and let you know just a little bit about him. You'll be able to tell as soon as he gets up here. We're going to do one more song, hopefully, <laughs> and um, just to set the mood, to sing about how great God is. And I'm going to ask you to sing along with me, if you would. <laughs> the splendor of the King. Thank you. 
I think I just want to have her keep singing. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you guys for coming to hear a kick from a cornfield. That's how I, it's funny when I speak, oftentimes they ask me, you know, what's your title? And I'm like, I don't, know. I don't have a title. Just call me a kick from a cornfield because that's where I grew up at, is uh, in a uh, cornfield in Indiana. Who here has ever been to Indiana? Nothing. I've been to there, yes. Just a couple people. So I'm, uh, I grew up um, north of Indianapolis, west of Fort Wayne, Indiana, 160 acre farm. We had pigs, we had cows, I was in 4-H, I was in Future Farmers of America, even though I had no desire to be a farmer, um, because there was a lot of hard work on the farm, but it did teach me um, you know, how to work hard and to appreciate when you have nothing, when you have to wear holes in your jeans before they became in, in chic and, uh, <laughs> and right. I had to put patches on them and stuff and it was uh, interesting, you know, growing up, uh, we had, I had two older brothers, I had a younger sister that was 10 years almost to the day born after me. I was born January 2nd, 67, she was born January 1st, 77. I was the first baby born in Whitley County, Indiana. She was the first baby born in Kosciuszko County, Indiana. Really? So it was kind of interesting having two New Year's babies in the same family. Um, but I grew up, um, you know, I, I had, I basically had a desire to get off the farm and I, I wanted to make, here's what I observed growing up. I observed that my mom and my dad would have um, frequent arguments because they didn't have any money. Like my mom wanted to go here or there and they didn't have any money. So I'm like, well, I, uh, discern that okay, if you have a lot of money, then you're not going to have any fighting and arguing and strife, you know, right? That's what you would think, but you see a bunch of people in Hollywood and stuff that have money, that's all they do is strive and fight and argue. So, um, so essentially, um, I observed a lot when I was growing up, and I also observed a lot of these marriages that didn't seem like the people liked each other. <laughs> I'm like, well, why is that? If they're going to church, they're Christians, right? So therefore, why would they strive? You know, it says in 2 Timothy 2, 23, 24, a servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all, you know? And I was like, well, then why are they striving? Why are they fighting? Then I was like growing up and getting older, and I had heard that the divorce rate was almost the same in the church as it was outside the church, you know, almost 50%. I'm like, what? Why is that? That is crazy. Well, then I started learning as I started going through my own life that, oh, there seems to be a trend that I'm kind of seeing, and then the Lord took me into an, a kind of an extreme uh, situation where I kind of had to um, endure a lot of uh, pain from a spouse of mine <laughs> that she had had pain when she had grown up, and her parents had pain when they grew up. So I started seeing this trend, and uh, the Lord then started to reveal to me about um, what was going on, and He said that I'm going to give you, bring you into a ministry that's not going to be easy, but he said it needs to happen before Christ comes back because there's a lot of people in church who think they're saved just because they show up in the pews every day. But what was interesting, and I didn't read, didn't read this in the first in the, this morning, but I always wondered about this verse in the Bible, Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Um, I'll read it. So that, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me, not just a few, but many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Which First John 3, 4 says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And I was like, well, wait a minute, if they're casting out demons, you know, who does that? You know, very few people do that. And then prophesize, you know, I saw some people that um, I knew personally that prophesied, but they seemed really mean. <laughs> they were not nice. And, um, and even doing many wonders, so I'm thinking, well, if they can't get into heaven, oh my gosh, you know, I, I was going to get into heaven. And the Lord started showing me, giving me revelation. He said, well, it comes down to a person's heart and their mind. You know, who are they really behind closed doors? Who are they to their spouse? How do they treat them? Who are they to their children? You know, if, you see a lot of people that, that aren't even in the church, and they're very nice, loving, sweet people. And then you see people in the church who are very prideful and arrogant and mean. And uh, what I really believe and what was kind of showing me is that those that are the prideful, mean people are not going to get into heaven. 
even though they may show up at the doors every day, even though they might be a pastor, a pastor's wife, a leader, it doesn't matter. The Lord knows their hearts and he knows their minds. And so I believe that there's going to be even some people that are not even, you know, uh, regular attenders because oftentimes they were hurt by people in the church and they want nothing to do with the hypocrisy of what they have observed. You know, I went through something that was pretty extreme and I could have been really, really, really hurt by this one pastor. And he was very prideful. He was very uh, mean. And um, ultimately I had a dream. The Lord told me um, in the dream, I showed it um, in the dream, they had about 200 people going to their church. And it was one of the faster growing churches in Indianapolis. In the dream, I saw 20 people in the church and I identified the pastor, his wife, their son-in-law, and a couple other people, everybody else I didn't re recognize. And so I woke up from the dream and I'm like, what was that all about? And the Lord said, or he asked me, he said, what day of the week do you think that service took place on? I'm like, oh no, probably Wednesday. There was like hardly anybody there. <laughs> he said, no, that's a Sunday morning. I'm like, no way. He's like, no, Yahweh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. it will be. And I'm like, no. So ultimately, it was interesting that um, the pastor and his son-in-law had a confrontation with me. And I don't like confrontations. I'd rather just back away and get along with people. But the Lord gave me boldness to confront them for the sins that they were in. And nobody else probably would have done that in all of Indiana. And, uh, but the anointing came on me. I was in front of my pastor, and I confronted them. They were teaching that um, that if you went to hell, God loved you so much, he would either burn you up so you wouldn't have any pain, or he would get you out of hell, give you one more chance. And I'm like, that is not in the Bible. That is wrong. Plus, uh, the son-in-law was driving a car he wasn't paying for. For six months, he was not paying the guy that he got a loan from. He was, like, stiffing him, taking advantage of that. And I'm like, that is so wrong. And I learned some other things later that he did. So ultimately, Lord, have you confront them in love, but I had a boldness on me that wasn't normally there. And then um, they walked away very smug and, and arrogant. And within a year, they were down to 20 people in the church. And God shut it down and said, you will not mock me. You know, And, uh, and it's interesting because they ended up selling the church to the Humane Society. And the Lord told me, just like Jezebel was eaten by the dogs, he sold the church to the dogs because they had operated in the spirit of Jezebel. And I was like, oh my gosh. She said, I'm going to do this to other churches as well because I'm tired of them because there are people in charge of these churches who are not who they say they are, who do not have my heart, who are hurting my people, who have already been hurt. And I want them to help them. So he said, I'm, I'm doing this for their own good. You know, they should not even be pastors, you know, that are hurting people. And so I'm going to expose some of this. You know, if they will not get delivered, I want them to repent. And if they won't, then I may have to expose this more publicly. I don't want to, he said, but it's better for their own salvation because they're not truly saved. They think that they are, but they're not. And they're hurting my people that have been hurt. So ultimately what I learned is that when we experience uh, pains and traumas along the way in our life, from our moms, from our dads, normally is the first way we get hurt, unfortunately. Um, or it could be stepfathers, stepmothers, or it could be a myriad of places we get hurt along the way. We, oftentimes, we get sexually touched inappropriately or violated. It's almost impossible not to have something happen that's improperly sexually to us, and especially with the internet the way that it is. So when that happens, the enemy, that's the way the enemy comes in to try to cause us to have painful thoughts and memories that can control us for a lifetime. So he keeps reminding us over and over and over again what our dad did to us, what our mom did to us, what our stepfather, stepmother, all these people. And um, we have our own thoughts, but then the enemy gives us thoughts because we know that because of what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter um, 10, 3 through 6. He said... For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing, which is every prideful thing, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So we're supposed to bring our thoughts into captivity. Why? Because a lot of the thoughts are coming from the enemy, not from us. And it was interesting. I was in Boise, Idaho, uh, a couple months ago, and the Lord said, how many thoughts per day do you think the average person has that's not gone through you know, deliverance? And I'm like, oh, I don't know, a couple thousand? <laughs> and he said, way low. He goes, like, Google it. 
So I'm like, okay, so I'm Googling it, and this came up. It said, in 2005, the National Science Foundation published an article summarizing research on human thoughts per day. It was found that the average person has up to 60,000 thoughts per day. And that exhausts people when you have 60,000 thoughts. What's interesting, it says, of those thoughts, 80% were negative, and 95% were exactly the same repetitive thoughts as the day before. So the enemy wants us to get a lot of these negative thoughts, remind us of all these traumas, and we get stuck on that. And oftentimes we don't think about our thoughts. You know, I'm, I'm, since 2009, since I went through, I got, went through my deliverance in 2008, the Lord did something to me and I was a different person. I was really much more patient and more nice and loving than I was before that. Um, but I noticed that the number of thoughts and stuff that I had, it seemed to come down, but I could now start to pay attention to what thoughts were coming into me. And I would actually think about where did that thought come from? Because oftentimes a thought would come against me if my wife would say something that was really mean, then the enemy would say, don't let her talk to you that way. You know, show her who's boss and da 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 da. And I'm like, wait a minute. And, and then oftentimes I would have these thoughts come in that would try to get me um, to say things to my stepsons, and I knew that if I did, they couldn't take it. They would, they would take an offense. And so I had to be very careful of what I said because I had to make it more gentle because they've been hurt a lot as well. So I started purposefully thinking about the thoughts, and before I spoke a word out, I'm like, okay, where will this go if I say this to somebody that can't take it? And if a person really gets angry easily and takes an offense to drop a path, they're not going to receive it. So I'm like, I really can't say there or go there with them on hardly anything. I have to be very, very careful. And so you've got to think before you speak. And of course, anybody doesn't want to do that. A lot of times people say, well, I just speak my mind. I'm like, well, if you're speaking your mind, maybe your mind needs to change because if you're not taking those thoughts captive, then you could be speaking some things that are not going to turn out well if you speak that. So oftentimes, the enemy wants to come and give us thoughts that will cause us to worry. Worry and fear and anxiety is coming from the enemy. Of course, it's not a fruit of the spirit. So there was another study that came out in, again, 2005. Lee, he studied at Cornell University. Scientists found that firstly, 85% of what we worry about never happens. Do you ever think about that? That's amazing, 85% what we worry about. And then the 15% that did happen, they said 79% of the subjects discovered they could either handle the difficulty better than expected or that the difficulty taught them a lesson worth learning. So the conclusion was that 97% of our worries are baseless. So we don't have to worry anymore. Yay. Well, the challenge, the challenge is, is a lot of times these thoughts are coming in, and unless you've gone through deliverance, which I'll explain, deliverance is a lot easier than I thought, and it's a lot more. It's not weird. You know, I try to make it as normal as possible, because I used to sell software to banks. You know, and it's funny, I get my hair cut you know, around the country at Great, or I used to get at Great Cliffs, now I get at Sport Cliffs. And they always ask you, what do you do? So I tell them up front, well, I used to sell software to banks. You know, I used to manage relationships between these banking core processors that manage all the data for the banks in the United States. And I, work, I first worked for a compliance company that was like loan software, new account software. And then I worked for an internet banking company that was the largest in the United States that was out of uh, LA, later bought by Intuit, and became Intuit Financial Services, which they're out of Mountain View, California, Northern California. And so when I explained to them, you know, now I help people who have had wounds from their fathers, mothers, stepfathers, stepmothers, sexual violations to have more peace in their life. That's really what it comes down to. So they don't strive and fight and argue. They can get along with their spouse and their children. And they're like, well, that's cool. Um, and then I start describing how the Lord showed me that most marriages, you have one person that's more dominant, that is more of the taker, that wants their way all the time, married to someone that's more of the giver that gives in all the time. And they come together. And then the Lord revealed to me that there was a couple in the Bible named Jezebel and Ahab. And they basically were the mold for that that has carried forward throughout time. Um, Ahab should not have married Jezebel, it's in 1 Kings and 2 Kings, um, because she was not a you know, godly woman. And uh, he came from a godly background. So he compromised his godly bar by marrying someone that he shouldn't have. And then she kind of usurped him with the authority, and she kind of ran the show. And she wanted to kill, she wanted to bring in the worship of Baal, um, introduce that into the godly background, which he allowed it to happen. He should have said, no, we're not worshiping Baal. No, we're not worshiping, we're not killing all the prophets of the Lord, which is what she did. 
and he allowed it to happen. And, uh, and, and it was horrible. You know, they even sacrificed babies to this god named Moloch. And uh, they allowed actually been to Israel back in 2009, saw where they used to like throw babies off of this uh, place down into this river, and it was just awful. And I was like, oh my gosh, why would they hurt babies? Well, the enemy wants to hurt us as young as possible. He wants us, and you think about abortion and stuff too, that's really coming underneath that same spirit today. You know, the enemy wants to kill, kill, take out our lives as early as possible. He wants to hurt us as much as possible. So if, if, if you go through some traumas, if you go through a father that didn't love you as much as he should have, or if you go through, you know, anyone that said anything to you that betrayed you, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's a myriad of things, um, stepfathers, stepmothers, pastors, teachers, all these are traumas that the enemy reminds you of. And then what happens is you start to develop a little anger and bitterness inside of you for them. And we know in the church that we're supposed to forgive people. But if we don't truly mean it with our heart, then the enemy has to leave a right to keep speaking to us all day long. And so we see a lot of these Christians that come to church that are, I would say, are not real. You think about the Pharisees and the scribes. The Lord Jesus Christ did not like them because he knew their hearts were wicked and their minds were not of, of God. They were, they were very judgmental, very um, uh, hypocritical. And so we see a lot of people in the church today that are like that. And uh, the reason why is because they've been hurt from the past. They have not truly forgiven those. That's a huge part is forgiving people. The other part we have to do is we have to humble ourselves from pride because whenever we get hurt in the past, and you will start to whisper to us that we can't trust anybody else. You need to do it yourself. You can't, you know, they're not going to do it right because why? Because our father, mother, whomever didn't protect us. So therefore, you're going to protect yourself. And so you end up not um, able to listen to your spouse and uh, to come to an agreement. So there's lots of strife, strife and fighting and arguing. And uh, that's what we see in the majority of marriages. And then that ends up oftentimes in divorce. And then if you still carry around, the enemy, so he still has a legal right to torment you, and then you will continue to perpetuate that, perpetuate that by getting married to somebody else that's very similar, even though you may think that they're completely different at first because the people will act all sweet and nice before you say, I do. And once you say, I do, you're like, you wish you said, I, I didn't. It's like, oh my gosh, it's too late, I did it again. Oh no. And it goes on and on and on. And on. So, That describes probably 90% of relationships is, are these two characters in the Bible, Jezebel and Ahab. And I'm going to read the characteristics of uh, what they cause us to do. Again, they're considered like the strong man of the enemy. You think about the strong man, he talks about you sweat, you know, you sweep up you know, the house and, and get it clean. Then you take out the strong man and then everything will go with it. Well, you think about in the Philistines when David came to fight Goliath. He cut off the head of the strong man, Goliath, and then everyone else scattered. So that's why we see a lot of people when they go through this deliverance is they're, they change, like their personality changes. They're smiling more. They're happy more. They don't strive as, as what they used to fight and argue. They're more peaceful. They're more like Christ. And uh, that's ultimately what the Lord wants. And so Jezebel, this um, you know, evil woman from back in the old, in first Kings, second Kings, this is the characteristics if we're hearing a lot of, of, of that chatter in our mind. Number one, it causes us to be anxious and fearful, even though we act very overconfident of ourselves, like we know everything. But underneath everything, we're really anxious and fearful because when we were growing up, we had our father, mother, stepfather, stepmother, whomever, do these things to hurt us. I had one man, he was having a sleepover when he was like six at a boy's house who had a father that was a pastor in their church. He ended up getting molested when he was on the sleepover. And he didn't tell anybody. So the rest of his life he started hearing these voices and reminding him about that and he couldn't trust you know, his wife and so he would take out a lot of control and anger on his wife. And um, you know, I had a woman that she had been molested by her brother, didn't tell anybody, and the brother had been molested by his pastor. And um, it caused her to marry a guy. She was very controlling. She blamed him for everything. He was very much quiet and, and getting along easily with people. But the enemy was telling her thoughts. He couldn't trust her husband. Her husband was out to get her. So it sabotaged their marriage. It went through a divorce. And then they ended up getting remarried again. And then they were going to go through another divorce. And then she came to one of these meetings last summer and she went through it. She got delivered. 
And then she came back and the husband, I asked him, so when did you notice something changed? She goes, well, she uh, said she was sorry and said she was wrong. And she had done that for like 11 years. I'm like, wow, but that would probably stand out to you. So, so anxiety and fear will come in. Control means that you need to make all the decisions as much as you possibly can. So if it comes down to who makes the decision, you're going to want to win at all costs. Um, because the enemy is telling you that your decisions are the best and nobody else's are good. And also you feel if you control the people that you will never be hurt again. But if you think about it, God doesn't control us. He loves us unconditionally, you know. Um, he gives us a chance, you know, a free choice of freedom to choose, and we have a free will. But people that operate in these spirits try to control the other person and take away their free will so that they cannot live life. And uh, it also causes people to be manipulative, which means that they will oftentimes guilt a person to do what they want. They'll say little things here and there to get them to do what they want such as maybe they want to have somebody watch their child or children for the weekend so they can go out and they tell their whatever friend, and if you don't watch my children, you know, I'm going to have my next door neighbor watch them and they're not saved and they could be hurt and that'd be all your fault. Oh, okay, I guess I'll watch your children for you. So they say things to manipulate. Um, it causes them to be jealous, very jealous. I remember my wife, I would be up at the front and we would uh, worship and Oftentimes there were a, a lot more women that would come up to the, to the front that would worship. And I would get a word from the Lord for someone. And some, more, more often than not, it would be for a woman because most of them were women. I mean, some of them are guys and I give words to these guys from the Lord. But um, she's like, you know, it's not proper for you to give words to women. I'm like, what? I'm like, I can't choose and decide who gets a word or not. If the person's there in front of me and the Lord tells me to speak it, I'm going to speak it. You know, why are you jealous of that? You know, but they'll manipulate things to to say, well, you know, that's not really proper. You shouldn't do that. And, and oftentimes they'll get angry if you're happy. They can't stand anybody to be happy because they're not happy. So if they're not happy, then they're not going to like it if you're happy. They, they can be very demanding. They'll raise their voice and have tones to get their way. They're going to be very selfish and um, oftentimes sexually impure. And uh, they will oftentimes lie and not tell the truth. So oftentimes when people tell you something, you're going to believe a person. You wouldn't believe a person's going to lie to you. But the spirit basically justifies the ends. However much means you have to do it. If you have to lie, then you're going to lie. And they can turn a whole church and ruin the whole church and cause the church to shut down by uh, spreading lies amongst the people. And uh, oftentimes churches don't grow very well because of that. People that operate in this. They um, have a desire to be in power and leadership. They want to shut down the true Holy Spirit from operating. They're dominant. They're intimidating. They're rebellious. They're suspicious of your intentions. They can be paranoid. They're very critical and judgmental. Rarely ever admit that they're wrong or apologize. Uh, act very assured of themselves but very insecure. Cannot stand to be told no. Love to provoke people to get them angry. And get a rise out of them. They'll like provoke, provoke, provoke. And if you don't say anything to them, they, they don't like that. So they'll keep provoking until you finally blow it. Ah, and they're like, oh, look how bad that you are. And like, well, I wouldn't behave this way if you hadn't provoked me. Oh, don't blame me for that. <laughs> you know? um, they'll, they will betray you. They are not loyal. They're oftentimes perfectionistic, but they think that their way is perfect. And maybe somebody else has a better way of doing something. And they will not uh, uh, stand for that. They have to do it your, their way. Oftentimes, there's, there's a double standard. So they may say to you, you know what? Um, I need to look at your phone and check your phone for all your messages and all your Facebook comments and messages. And by the way, you can't look at mine. <laughs> like, what? That's, that's not fair. Um, and I've seen this uh, more often with women that struggle with Jezebel than men but they will oftentimes drive a wedge between their own children. They will lie to each other's, uh, their siblings, say, you know what your brother said or your sister said this about you and it wasn't true? Trying to get them to not like each other. Um, and those that are the strongest of, of this description would be considered a narcissist by the psychological community. And the, and the psychologists say that there's no hope for them. Well, there is hope, and it's Jesus Christ, but they have a free will. 
So just like Jesus couldn't get the Pharisees delivered because their hearts were hard and he knew their hearts were wicked. So we cannot override anyone's free will. That's what makes it more challenging. They have to humble themselves. And it's a, it's a win-win if they do it because they're going to be a different person. They're going to be happier to get along with, more loving. And they're not going to strive and fight in their marriage anymore or with their children. They can apologize to their children and say, I'm so sorry for how I treated you. And the children's hearts are just waiting to hear that. You know, they're going to be crying, saying, oh my gosh, is this real? Are you really a different person? Um, and so then there's this um, Job 41 that talks about Leviathan. And uh, again, when I grew up, no pastors ever told us anything about Leviathan. Like, what the heck's a Leviathan? <laughs> And the Lord's like, look it up, read Job 41. So I'm reading Job 41, and it describes like this, kind of like an alligator. It has, it says its rows of scales or its pride. It has lots of teeth. Um, but if you read the last two verses of it, it really explains what it is. It says, on earth there is nothing like him. This is Job 41, 33 to 34. On earth there is nothing like him which is made without fear. He beholds, so he's in charge of every high thing, which is prideful thing. He is king over all the children of pride. So pride always comes in when we're hurt. And pride really ruins relationships. Who wants to be around someone that's prideful? You know, it got Lucifer kicked out of heaven and he became Satan. And you know, it can keep people from going to heaven. The Lord does not like pride. He wants to take it out of our lives. And pride, I've also noticed with Leviathan, it will twist communication in a person's mind. So they will see reality differently. Like they will not take responsibility for things that they said or did that turned out bad. They will blame other people. Oftentimes they'll blame you. And you'll be looking like in your mind thinking, wait a minute, how can they truly believe that they didn't say this when they did? Because uh, I know they did, but I can't prove it because they didn't record it. <laughs> it's almost like you have to record your conversations 24 hours a day. Then you can remind them, this is what you said, this is what you did. Because otherwise, it will cause them never to take responsibility for things that turned out to be bad. And um, I noticed uh, when I helped people go through getting free from this, that they would oftentimes feel Leviathan unwrap from their spine because they oftentimes would have back pain and neck pain and headaches. Um, they couldn't sleep through the night. It would wake them up. They'd have insomnia. And if they tried to read the Bible or Christian books, it would cause them to be tired and they couldn't stay awake. Um, oftentimes people struggle with scoliosis or fibromyalgia. I used to have scoliosis, so I have had this in, in my life. And other diseases. And we can pick up this if we ever had relatives involved in any type of secret societies where they you know, made oaths that were not to the Lord. And that can come down and affect us. And then the, those that struggle more with the spirits of Jezebel and Leviathan will marry someone oftentimes that have Ahab. Ahabs don't like confrontation. They um, have a strong uh, challenge of being a strong leader, and they have a strong desire to make everybody happy. They're afraid of being rejected, and uh, they'll take responsibility pretty quickly. And uh, they're very nice people, but they tolerate things they shouldn't. You know, I know that because I struggled more with Ahab, but I also had some of the spirits of Jezebel and Leviathan. So, um, but you'll normally default more often to one or the other. And normally if you get hurt really, really deeply from father or mother, um, that's what really dictates how strong a level of like the spirit of Jezebel is. Those that get hurt worse throughout their lifetime oftentimes pick up a strong version of that spirit of Jezebel. And so um, these are the characteristics that drive, most, that drive most people. You know, if you actually can get it down to where you can see this now, you're like, oh my gosh, almost every couple that you know, you can pick out. <laughs> this person's more Jezebel, this one's more Ahab. Jezebel is more controlling, dominant. I always say it's, there's like givers and takers that marry, that find each other. Those that are the takers struggle more with Jezebel. Those that are the givers are more of the Ahab. And you see that in the majority of relationships. Um, you can see a Jezebel marry Jezebel, but you'll always have one that's very demanding, very physically intimidating, marrying someone that's more subtle. Um, but you see most of them with Jezebel and Ahab. So the Lord basically showed me this. He said, Nelson, when we get people set free from this, because then they're going to have peace in their thoughts. They're not going to strive. They're not going to argue. They're going to be healed from things, too. Because he showed me um, uh, Naaman. If you think about Naaman, he had leprosy, and he wanted to be healed. So he went to Elisha. It's like, hey, can you pray for me? I've got leprosy. I don't want it. And um, he said, um, well, 
you have to go down to the Jordan River and dip seven times, and then you'll get your healing. And he's like, I'm not going to the Jordan River. That's filthy dirty. And I've been baptized in the Jordan River, and they have rats and stuff there, not a clean river. And uh, he, got, he took an offense. He's like, I'm not going to do that. He's like, well, then you're not going to get healed. Okay. <laughs> he says, well, can I go to these two clean rivers that are over here? <laughs> Please? Is, is the Shenandoah River clean, by the way? Is it? Okay. So he's like, hey, I want to go to the Shenandoah River. <laughs> you know? And it's like, no, we got to go to the filthy, dirty river. So. so he did that, and he dipped seven times. And then he came out, of course, seventh time, and he was healed. And so the Lord had shown me, he said, there's a lot of people walking around with a lot of pride that need to humble themselves. He goes, and then I'll be able to heal them. But it's up to them. Do they want to do the work or not? And I'm like, oh, well, that makes sense, you know. So the Lord has basically been trying to show me to take out every legal right, I call it, that the enemy has to torment us. And again, a lot of it's precipitated on us. If we have a lot of pride in our life, you know, most of us do. Most of us don't see it. I never saw it in me. I would never admit and thought that I was prideful, but I was. Then I'm like, let's take that out of the equation so the enemy doesn't have a right to do that. The other thing is we have to forgive people that hurt us. And well, that can be really hard if somebody got hurt really badly by their dad or their mom or stepfather, stepmother, whomever. Because the enemy wants to keep reminding you every single day of your life, like having 60,000 thoughts a day about all these horrible things people did. You know, and who doesn't want to entertain that? But if you entertain that thought, it's going to cause you not to be at peace. It's going to cause you to have a lot of anger rise up in bitterness. So if the person were to walk in the room right now that hurt you, what would you do? Do you want to punch them? <laughs> well, you'd probably not have forgotten, forgiven them at that point. Because oftentimes we come to church, we know we're supposed to forgive, but the Lord knows our heart and our mind. And actually the enemy knows too, because the enemy knows if we completely forgive someone, that takes away the legal right that he has. Because now we're not going to have the anger and the bitterness and the reminding of all that. And we see a lot of people that strive in their marriages and they keep on all of this horrible things they'll bring up over and over again. You did this, 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 this bad thing to me. And you have to understand, the enemy is behind all of that stuff. And if we can understand that, you can separate the enemy from the person. Um, so there was a movie called The Shack. Anyone see The Shack? So I remember I didn't watch it first. There was a lot of controversy. I didn't even know what the controversy was. So I was busy. And so the Lord said, I want you to watch that movie. I'm like, really? Okay. So I watched it. And I watched it again, like, within a week. And I watched it again. I watched it three times. And I never watched the movies, like, three times a week. And there was a scene, in, well, I'll describe for those of you who have not seen it. Um, the premise of it is this man, this boy, when he was a boy, he got beat up by his father, abused in the shack. So, of course, he's angry at his dad. He's angry at God because God represents his father. And, he, and why didn't you help me, God? You know, he's mad at God for, for not protecting him. And the enemy, of course, is lying to him. So what happened was that there was an angel that took him into a cave and said, okay, you're so mad at God, you be God. You decide who goes to heaven and hell. He's like, no, I don't want to do that. It's like, well, you're going to do that. So they showed him some pictures some videos of people that were like killing people and murdering and drugs and all this stuff. And it's like, that person goes to hell. That person goes to hell. That person goes to hell. Then they showed him a little boy. The little boy was like eight years old. And um, he was in a shack. And he's like, well, that little boy, he's innocent. He didn't do anything wrong. And then they backed up from that. And they showed him getting beaten up and smacked by his dad. He said, that little boy was your father. And at that point, it hit him. He's like, oh my God. My dad was beat up by his dad, and that's why he beat me up. Ah, so now he could forgive his father for the evil stuff that he did because, and that's how it works. That's how it works, really. How it comes down generations. That's why we have people that are struggling with alcohol and addictions and stuff. It's because essentially the same demons that are tormenting great grandpa or grandpa, tormented dad, torment us, and then we take it out on our kids, and it passes on down the bloodline. And so we can break it off, but we have to forgive. And if you can't forgive, then the enemy has a legal right to keep giving us 60,000 thoughts a day, of which 80% are negative and 95% are repetitive. And then you normally strive and fight and argue with your spouse. And oftentimes you never take responsibility very rarely. So it causes you to blame that person over and over again. And that person oftentimes loves us, but they're just getting worn down. And I've seen a lot of times when women marry women have more of the Ahab married to men that have Jezebel oftentimes their bodies can't take it and they start to get sickness because of that 
I had a guy that was a friend um, with, he came to our church in Indianapolis, and he seemed so sweet, so gentle, so loving. But behind closed doors, he was not that person. He was berating his kids and yelling, and his wife ended up getting yelled at enough that she ended up getting a tumor in her brain and dying at age 40. And um, then he got remarried to another woman who was healthy, and then within a year, she started getting sickness in her body. So it's hard for women to be around men that are really controlling and manipulative. And uh, so we have to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, Lord, is that, is that, is that really? Is it? And if we humble ourselves and say, yeah, um, that I might have some of this, then I don't want it. That's what our attitude should be. But the Lord will not override our free will. So if we want to keep this, we can. Because again, the Pharisees and the, and the scribes, they kept it. They were prideful and arrogant. Jesus couldn't get them. They hated him. You know, that's why oftentimes I like, there's churches that will not let me come in to talk about this because in their leadership, they have this operating people and therefore they don't want to be found out about it. And I'm like, really? I'm like, come on. There's people that like attend their church that are getting freed and they sit under their teaching at church and they're not getting freed. So they're like, well, they need to actually watch this. I'm like, yeah, I go, but the Lord's using it through Facebook and YouTube. I have a TV show that comes out on Sundays all over the United States, which is crazy. And I talk about this. It's on Direct TV. It's now on Spectrum. Um, and it's on, I don't know, 10 or 12 others. Um, it's also live streaming. So people are watching this. And it's, you know, there's, I don't know how many. I've, I've gone from like a couple hundred people that follow me on Facebook to 50,000 now. And it keeps growing every week. And I'm like, only you, God, could do this with a kid from a cornfield, you know? Because <laughs> I had no desires to do ministry at all, you know? And, I, and the Lord took away all the money that I had. He said, I had to change your heart, Nelson, to humble you. So he took away everything I had. I had about half a million dollars, and it was gone. And uh, not because I spent it foolishly, but the Lord said, I'm going to take it away from you so I can humble you. And then when I have your heart, then I will start to bring you into this ministry. And then he said, I'll have people that will make donations all over the world. And they are, because they're saving their marriages now. And they're seeing miracle healings now. And so I'm just traveling throughout, you know, right now in the United States and Canada. Um, like uh, the Lord told me tomorrow, go to Washington, D.C., make some declarations. <laughs> You know, in D.C., I'm like, okay. So at the spur of the moment, I can because I don't have a house. I don't have a house. I don't have an apartment. I live out of my car. I live with other people oftentimes in, uh, in their homes or um, hotels. But it's blowing my mind because it's continuing to grow. And the Lord said, also, there will be millions that will actually hear about this. And it will change, you know, their lives. And they will not strive. They will not fight. They will not argue. I have so many testimonies from people that their marriages, I mean, you could see them. They're, they're smiling now instead of being sad. And uh, I'll show you, um, this is a couple of a couple of ladies that they went through deliverance and they would never have thought they had it in. They were, they were in the church, they went on mission trips, and uh, but they were struggling with this because they grew up with wounds in their life. But this is a before picture. She's now one of my directors of our, our restorative freedom deliverance team around the world. That's her before picture. And um, this is her after picture. You can see in the eyes. The eyes are like the windows to a person's soul. So you can see a much more peaceful person now. And uh, she took her whole family through it. Her kids were like ages, I don't know, five, seven, 11, something. And uh, they're all doing amazing now. And her, and her kids are doing much better in school because they're not hearing all this chatter up here from the enemy. And then this is her sister. And again, you can see the eyes and the eyebrows oftentimes kind of show you. And after, looks like that, peaceful. And now she hears the Lord more clearly. It's funny because when she went through it, she's like instantly, she didn't hear the enemy chatter anymore. She's like, oh, it'll come back, it'll come back. And it never did. She's like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And uh, the, the first miracle I saw actually was my own son. He had a boy that showed him some things and did some things he shouldn't have in our neighborhood. So he was affected for 10 years. He was disrespectful to me. He punched me. He was violent. He was awful. I was going to move him out of the home. It was so bad. But that's the before picture of my son. He had the gauges in his ears. And the enemy kept telling him, keep making the gauges bigger until it tore his ear rope. And it was dangling. And uh, when he got freed, 
the next day, and I just prayed for him. I just I didn't I didn't know how to pray before. I just took authority in Jesus' name, commanded the enemy to go, and it did. And I was like, oh my gosh. The next day, he's like, can I mow the grass for you, Dad? Um, I also want to apply for a job at Burger King, get a haircut. And so physically, he changed. This is nine months later. So you can see how dramatic some of these changes are. We see a lot of people that are just amazed. It's so amazing, this. So I'm like, wow, God, I don't want to do this. This is way better than selling software to banks. Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> people are like, oh my gosh, save my marriage. Save uh, striving, fighting, arguing. And uh, I get messages every day now. It's hard to keep up. It's like I can't interview people fast enough that are going through this. It's like, it's amazing. So... So well, anyway, what was interesting is as I read more in the Bible, like Galatians, um, Galatians 5, 16 through 26, it says, I say then, walk in the spirit, and, the, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, which is being unholy, lewdness, sexually impure and lustful, idolatry, anything you put before the Lord, sorcery, which people think about witchcraft, but um, at the basic level of witchcraft, it's controlling other people. You know, saying things, you better do this, or I'm not going to do this, so it's controlling them. That's really what... It comes down to now. Yes, there are witches out there. I've learned there's like 1.5 million witches that attend the churches now in the United States and do curses, and they can astral project. They can listen into conversations. I've learned this firsthand. I didn't want to learn this. I didn't want to know this, but there are there's like more there's more witches in the in the church than Presbyterian. There's like 1.4 million Presbyterian, 1.5 million witches. I mean, it's, it's exploding now all around the United States. And uh, they're on Facebook. They're teaching people. You know, it's a hotbed. I know, like in the in South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, probably in Virginia. I mean, it's, it, I mean, think about 1.5 million. You divide that by 50 states. That's 30,000 per state. That's a lot. So, and you still used to have like 100,000 maybe 10 years ago. So it's really growing fast. Um, but these other characteristics. Think about this. This is really describing people that struggle with Jezebel hatred. Contentions, which is striving, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy. All that stuff's Jezebel. That's a lot of people, a lot of people in the church that are operating in that. Uh, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things, so they operate in that on a regular basis, will not inherit the kingdom of God. So it's pretty clear right there. If we operate in a lot of that stuff on a regular basis, we're not really a Christian. Even though we can act like we are, we can be in the church, we can prophesy over people, we can pray in the Spirit. So, uh, But it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is, so when people go through and get delivered, then they're going to have this evident in their life all the time. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, not just patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So they're going to become more Christ-like on a regular basis. Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, which is prideful, provoking one another, envying one another. So I'm like, ah. So that makes sense. That's what a true Christian really is, is we look at the fruit, we look at our hearts, we look at the mind. So, and so um, it's quite interesting. Um, uh, and, and again, it comes down to how we go through deliverance. Deliverance, I, I do this again throughout all over the place in churches that will let me come in. <laughs> Those that have a strong version of this. Oh no, we can't do that. I'm like, really? We can't do what Jesus said we're supposed to do in the Bible, in the church? And the Lord's like, yeah. In fact, I'm going to start doing conferences of 500 people to 1,000 in hotels. Because the Lord told me, you got to do this outside the church because there's too many churches out there that are tainted 
with people that have these spirits in leadership. So we're going to start doing our first, uh, I call it True Freedom Conference in Cleveland, Ohio, November the 16th. And we have lots of people all in the United States that are planning to go to that. We're going to do our next one in January in Houston, and then February in Phoenix, in March probably Florida, and then I don't know where they're after, but the Lord's like, we're going to start doing this, and then the people that are in the churches that won't let this go on in their church will be jealous in a healthy way because there'll be a lot of people from their congregations going to these and saying, oh my gosh, I got healed of this, 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 this. I don't fight anymore in my, my marriage. I get along with people now. I'm happy. You know, I feel so much freer. And uh, it, it'll be amazing to watch all that. So really what it comes down to is we have to forgive people. That's a huge thing. Forgive them. And what was interesting, um, I was in Gillette, Wyoming, and I think it was in April or May. I had to drive around a blizzard. It was funny. I was in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And, they, and the shortest distance to get to Gillette was on, I think it's Interstate 90. That parallels the lower part of North Dakota or South Dakota. But they had a blizzard coming. So I had to go all the way around the blizzard to get there because I'm driving everywhere. And um, so when I went there, I did ministry. And then it was like a couple days later. I'm like, I want to go to Mount Rushmore, which I'd seen it once before. But then I wanted to go see the Badlands. Because I'm like, I've never seen how bad the Badlands are. <laughs> I want to see why. I mean, anything called the Badlands must be really horrible. So so I drove to the Badlands. And it was very dusty, very dirty. And I came back, and my car was filthy. And I was going to the car wash the next day. And I said to the Lord, I'm like, gosh, Lord, it would be nice if I could just wash my car once and be done with it. And you know, forever, because I have to wash it every week because it gets filthy dirty. And he's like, yeah, well, that's kind of like it is. Uh, with a person that's you know, trying to be a Christian on earth is they're in the badlands and people are saying things, doing things to hurt them. Their spouse oftentimes, their father, their mother, their friends, their family, people in church, people at work, they're in the badlands, you know, because we, we don't have heaven on earth yet. So we're not in heaven. So um, he said, what you have to do to stay clean as a Christian is you have to forgive people from the past, from the present, and those in the future, they're going to hurt you. Because that's how you uh, keep the enemy off of you. Because it's if you take an offense or get angry at somebody that hurts you, then the enemy has legal right to keep coming against you and your thoughts. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so good. You know, how can you teach me this when I'm going through a car wash? You know, it's like, it's so basic, but it's so true. He said, yeah. He goes, so you have to forgive people to stay clean, and you have to repent for what you've done to hurt people, and, and repent for any pride. Keep yourself clean. He said, then the enemy is not going to be up here giving you 60,000 thoughts a day. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. So I'm, like, I'm going to use that if I can, God. He's like, yeah, please do. So I've been sharing that. I'm like, well, then that's what, you know, once you go through deliverance to completely be free, how do you know? People always ask me. I'm like, well, you're going to have a lot of peace. You're not going to have much strife. And you're going to be humble. You know, and people will notice the difference in your life. And then that's just a matter of, if you're around people every day, they're going to say things to hurt you. you got to keep forgiving them. And it doesn't seem right because it's like, ah, you want them to be paid back for the evil that they're doing. And, but you have to be unoffendable. You know, it's funny. We went to eat at this restaurant. What's it called? Uh, Hawksville Diner. Hawksville Diner. And I uh, ate there yesterday for dinner and uh, ate there again today for lunch. And there was a waitress that was there that oftentimes I like to have banter back and forth. It's kind of fun, because I like to have fun. And I remember I was putting my cup on the table, and the table kept sliding like 12 inches, you know, because it was a little bit slanted. I'm like, I started saying, oh my gosh, this is such a cool cup. What's this, you know? And, and then the, the waitress came up and said, well, it's only because the table slanted. I'm like, no, don't say that. You're ruining it for me, you know? <laughs> And so today, she actually wasn't there at the beginning, but then at the end she came in, she started bantering again back and forth, and then she told me, she goes, you know what? She goes, most times I'm talking to people, they can't take this because they'll take an offense. And I'm like, oh, that's sad. I go, I never take an offense. I go, I love to laugh at myself, you know, it's fun. And uh, I tease people and stuff, and she said, yeah, she goes, I wish more people you know, would be like that because it makes life a lot more fun. So. What I've learned is people go through deliverance, they have a lot more fun. Now I talk about, the people say that blondes have more fun. I'm like, no, delivered blondes yeah. have more fun. <laughs> Those that aren't That's delivered, right. you can go to Hollywood and see all these beautiful women out there that are a mess, that people are like, I don't care how beautiful you are, you're, you're mean, you know? 
And that's exactly what's happening. Just like a lot of guys, you know, that are looking really handsome or whatever, they can get really prideful and arrogant. People are like, I don't want to be around that person. It really looks, you got to look at the heart. You know, I think, you know, what, what do women really want and what do men really want? You know, yes, they want to be loved. Yes, they want to be respected. But if they're hearing 60,000 thoughts a day from the enemy, it's like, it's not going to work. So you go to counseling all day long. You can go to pastors for some help. But if they don't get to the root issue, you know, think about, uh, I'll talk about the gun thing that just happened, the mass murder that happened in El Paso and in uh, Dayton, Ohio. I tell people guns aren't the problem. It's the people behind the guns that pull the trigger and what they're hearing. That's the problem. We get them set free, delivered, and guess what? They can handle the guns. But if they're hearing the voice, they may be telling them to shoot and kill people, then you know, we have to get them free. The guns are not the problem. So if they're getting going about it the wrong way, you know, trying to you know, ban guns and all that stuff, that's you know, crazy. We need to help people get set free. And a lot of times they're in the church. <laughs> we need to get them set free. So, so essentially, um, what it comes down to is we have to forgive everybody who hurt us. Everybody. If you don't do that, you're not going to be at peace. You're not going to be getting along with your spouse. You're not going to get along with your children. And uh, we have to also do our own and say, Lord, I'm sorry for what I have done and repent for our own pride. So so that's really what it comes down to. Um, and it's not hard to do, but for a lot of people, it is hard because they've heard these voices their whole life. And oftentimes it reminds them of all the trauma from their dad or their mom or it's like, you don't have any idea how horrible that they were to me. I'm like, no, I don't. You know, the Lord does. And he's sorry that you went through that. But it didn't just start with your father or mother or whomever else. Someone had hurt them before that. And then someone had hurt them before that. In fact, there was a guy named Bob Larson. Anyone ever heard of Bob Larson? He had like a deliverance ministry. He's not, I'm not a Bob Larson. <laughs> he is uh, pretty uh, uh, wild. But there was a woman that he was uh, working with trying to get her set free. She was from Alabama. And uh, he actually, you know, was talking to the spirit that was affecting her and found out, because he asked him, when did this start? And, and it was something like 25 generations before when this woman, because the woman he was working with had molested her daughter. And it started 25 generations before, they said, or that whatever great, 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 great you know, grandmother had molested her child. And then that child was molesting their child. And it kept going on and on and on and on. It's like, so this makes sense. You think about it, it's like, oh, okay. Well, then how do we how do we change ourselves? It's like, well, we gotta forgive people. We have to keep forgiving people. Because just because you do it today doesn't mean you walk out the door and all of a sudden somebody does something to you, offends you, you take an offense. You know, so many people take an offense, the drop of a hat now, and especially uh, in our politically correct world. Oh, I'm offended, I'm offended. Like, really? You're supposed to be unoffendable. A servant of the Lord must not strive, you know, be gentle to all. So what we're going to do, and again, I've seen a lot of people that have gotten healed instantly, and some people have gotten healed from things progressively, is for those of you um, that can stand, going to have everybody stand, you're basically going to take your authority in Jesus' name, and then I'm going to lead you through some prayers. So oh, I keep reminding how my butt gets sore after I... <laughs> I bet, yeah. All righty. Um, so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off and just pray that uh, you know, we're all at peace. And then I'm going to pray that the Lord shows us all those that have hurt us over our lifetime. And then shows you why they hurt you, just like in the movie The Shack. If you can see why a person did some things to you that they shouldn't have, you can forgive them of anything. You know, it's really hard if someone's raped you, violated you, if you're a woman, or if, if you're a guy. But if you can see that, okay, that person was hurt by somebody, and the Lord will show you that, then you can forgive them. So, okay, it really wasn't them that did it. It was the enemy whispering them 60,000 thoughts, and then they weren't in their right mind. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So if we can get to that, you know, I can forgive my, my ex-wife because... I know that that was not really her. It was the enemy that had been tormenting her for her whole lifetime. So I have compassion for that. And um, so that's what we're going to do first, is to forgive. And I'm going to pray that the Lord shows you all those that have hurt you. 
and then we're going to take responsibility for what we've done and ask the Lord to forgive us and forgive us for our pride and then I'll just take authority and uh, a lot of you will see some things like you'll feel lighter we have a lot of people that attend this morning they're like oh my gosh I feel like I lost 10 pounds like, who doesn't want to lose 10 pounds <laughs> but they feel lighter <laughs> And, and uh, oftentimes you'll feel like your neck and stuff will get healed and the diseases will be healed and we've seen a lot of cool things that have happened. One woman came from uh, Michigan, 13 hours to Wichita, Kansas, and she didn't get healed at the meeting, but when she came back to Michigan, she got healed. Another guy had uh, pain, a uh, huge pain, seven years um, getting hit by a car, a woman that was drunk, and it was seven years prior, and um, he had painkillers like morphine and codeine. He was taking severe stuff. He was in pain. And um, he felt this Leviathan spirit unwrap from the spine. And he got healed. Because you can imagine if somebody hits you and they mess up your body, you're probably going to be a little angry at them. <laughs> and the enemy's going to be right there saying, oh my gosh, they were horrible. So when he went through and forgave them, he got his healing. And he came back the next day and he was able to bend over, standing, and touch his nose to his knees. He said, I couldn't do that before. I'm like, well, I can't do that now. <laughs> it's like, how in the world can you even do that? It's like, you're like, contortions now. He said, I have no more pain. He said he was walking normal. And he used to have, he'll have to be picked up sometimes going to church because he was in such pain. His pastor had to pick him up. So, so here we go. So thank you, Heavenly Father, right now. I just uh, take authority. We just bind any and all enemy spirits in the name of Jesus. And we charge the angels to come into position over us. Give us peace. And let the Holy Spirit flow and direct in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now I'm going to pray. Holy Spirit, show everyone, all those in our past and present who have hurt us, and show us why those people did those things to us so we can forgive them once and for all and give them to you. And then they're responsible to you to do the right thing. But uh, we're going to free ourselves today from any legal right that the enemy has to torment us. So right now, I'll just uh, be quiet and let the Holy Spirit show you over the last, uh, your entire lifetime. Give them an 
certain level of discernment so that they can shut down any voices from the enemy in Jesus' name. Now we speak to their bodies, the sickness, the pains, the diseases. We curse you right now in the name of Jesus. The legal right has been taken away from you now. And so we speak health and wholeness through every cell in your body in Jesus' name. We speak to your spines. Let the spines be healed now in Jesus' name. Top of their seat here at the lower lumbar community, just come into perfect position. Any legs that are shorter than the other, we command them to grow out to be the same length. We command all sickness, pain, diseases to leave their bodies. We pray that they will not have another headache ever again in Jesus' name, that they will sleep soundly when they sleep tonight and thereafter, that they will have good dreams, that they will remember the dreams, and the Holy Spirit will give them the interpretation of those dreams. We thank you, Father God. Allow them to hear your voice now clearly and allow them, Heavenly Father, to become Christ-like now, to truly see themselves as you see them, Lord, that you love them dearly. Thank you, Father God. And then if we need to take responsibility and apologize to our children or others, we will do that. We will make it right. We thank you, Father. Amazing. 
I take a business-like approach to this because Lord said, you know, I, I told him, I'm like, listen, I'm a business guy and I'm not weird. And if this is going to be weird, I'm not doing this thing. <laughs> and so a lot of times, like, the, I have this TV show and the guy watched uh, my, how I do this and he was like, you are the calmest deliverance guy I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, I'm not weird. You know, mama didn't raise no weirdos. So, <laughs> so basically, I just explain it. Let the Holy Spirit get around, you know. You don't have to be weird about this, you know. And that's why I can get into doing this in masses. You know, I've done churches of up to three, four hundred people at once. And the Lord's showing me now it's time to take it out into the hotels and do 500 to 1,000 at once. I really want to do stadium fulls. You know, because it's all nice and dandy. You go to the stadium, you sing some Christian songs, but if you don't ever change and you keep being mean, yes. then what good is all that? Yes. Let's get to the root yes. issues and get them set free, truly, yes. and see 50,000 people at a pop get set free. You know, it's amazing. So I'll turn this over to Lisa. Grateful for Nelson, aren't you? God has spoken to him and has given his life to him. It's amazing. Let's just sing a little bit, right? Let's do that. Let's worship. How great.
and you all pray for me right now because I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with this sober boy. <laughs> and, uh, Amen. I Amen. love God. <laughs> really hear me. Amen. Thank you. Here. Wait, wait, wait. Give him your name.
called the shack. And there was some controversy. But just like me standing up here, God said, get up there and tell them what I want you to tell them. I drove up here four hours. I don't know why I came up here. I didn't know anything about this gentleman here. I didn't know you were going to be here or you were going to be here. God knew. And I don't know if I'm talking to you, but I'm talking to somebody. Amen. But forgive and love others as God loves us. Amen. It's freedom. It's yes. freedom. Thanks, Amen. Lord. Thank you. Love you all.
glory to God. It is straight. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 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 Okay. Well, of um, course 
can. <laughs> yes. So I forgot to uh, say this up at the beginning, but those who have traveled the farthest in number of hours get free books. Anyone travel more than four hours to come tonight? Well, I round up. Yeah. I'll round up so you get four free books for driving Aww. here. Awesome. So I love to reward that. The record is that there's a woman from New Jersey that drove to Wyoming on a bus. It was 48 hours. Oh. She got 48 free books. <laughs> <laughs> I had to ship them back there. So, so thank you guys for coming tonight. And um, and again, if you want to make an offering, where's the? There's a basket right there, basket right there on there. the end. Okay. Right. We're do an offering. Yes. yes. Very and your books much. are back there. Yeah, and I'll be back there with the books, and I can take credit cards as well. So, thank you so much. Yeah.